Welcome back. We're reading Thomas Jefferson's Yard of Power by John Meacham. And we're in a new section and it's titled What Fixed the Destinies of My Life. All right, let's begin. Page 17. A college life centered on the Wren Building, which was in 1760, a three and a half story brick walled structure topped by a cupola. A chapel and a crypt had been added in the previous 30 years. Three blocks east along Duke of Gloucester Street was Bruton Parish Church on the left, followed by the Palace Green leading to the Governor's Palace. Farther down, the Duke of Gloucester set the brick capital, home to the House of Burgess and the General Court. There then, and not a quite half a square mile, no one landmark more than a few minutes' walk, or even a brief ride in one of the carriages, that were so prominent when Williamsburg was full and busy with the public business. Was the whole structure of public power in, Jeffer in Jefferson's Virginia? The whole structure of public power? A degree, but I wouldn't say the whole. No one could have loved it all more than Jefferson himself, for Jefferson, William, and Mary was largely about what university life is supposed to be about. Oh, I, I I read a quote a quote from him once that it's a uh, like a oh it's on the tip of my tongue. It's summarizing it. It's like you're there to kind of you know cultivate yourself, manifest yourself. Okay, well, let's see what the author summarized it as: reading books, enjoying the company of the like-minded, and savoring teachers who seem to be ambassadors from other richer, brighter worlds. Oh yes, now I remember. So I I agree with that. In college, you're gonna read a lot of books right hopefully and hopefully you read them outside of life right enjoying the company of the like-minded yes but you also need people of the opposite i think there should be i used to not think this but i do think that institutions should have have especially for the political science departments you need to have republicans you need to have libertarians you need to have communists socialists you need to have all types of political parties even if it's an international political party, maybe, but you need to have them represented if you're a good institution. An overwhelmingly percentage of political science teachers are Democrats, and this is going to produce a very skewed perspective. If you're going there to just live in a safety pin, right, of like an echo chamber of your own intellectual and political ideas, you're not really going to progress or know how to talk to a communist or talk to an imperialist. Do you see what I'm saying? You gotta really know how to have these exchange about ideas and if you never encounter them on campus and it's just everybody around you is like, I agree with you, I agree with you. Indeed, you don't want there to be constant fighting, but you do want there to be a little bit of a pushback. I don't know. I get kind of really fed up with uh, Marxist, Democratic, uh, teachers because it's like you're not getting any new information and the way in which they discuss their opponents ideas you can tell that they're very biased right and you're like well I, you want the professor to show who they are right but you do want them to educate you because you don't want it to be dry and boring like here's the facts but you also don't want them to be like I think this and then your whole lecture is that it's I think it's like an equilibrium like a balance of both so yeah, you want to have clubs and groups where you can gather together like-minded, but a good campus to me has both or even many ideologies represented. Not just how many people do we have that are lesbian, how many do we people do we have of uh, that have this 700 gender gender identity, right? You it's more than just surface level. It's ideas are more important than, you know, your gender, your skin tone, your religion, right? Your ideas. That's what I think. And savoring teachers who seem to be ambassadors from other richer, bridal worlds. You know, I one day, God willing, when I'm a teacher, I really hope... You can be a teacher right now. We all can teach each other. We're all students. We're all teachers in a way. But I'm hoping that one day when I'm in front of a class, but, you know, universities are making it kind of hard for teachers to kind of be themselves sometimes for fear of the social justice mob but I would love to meet some teachers like that I've met some who are wise 
but uh, maybe I'll meet more one day. Jefferson believed Williamsburg the finest school of manners and morals that ever existed in America. <laughs> the man who put him on the path towards that hyperbolic but heartfelt conclusion was Dr. William Small, a Scottish layman and professor who brought an Enlightenment worldview to Williamsburg. It was fruitless that Jefferson encountered Small at all, for Small's stay on the faculty at William and Mary uh, lasted only six years, from 1758 to 1764. The right period to overlap with Jefferson, who revered him, it was my great good fortune, and probably fixed the destinies of my life, that Dr. William Small of Scotland was then professor of mathematics, a man profound in most of the useful branches of science, with a happy talent of communication, correct and gentlemanly manners, and an enlarged liberal mind. Now, when they say liberal, they think in a classical liberalism, not the far extremist, Antifa social justice warrior, 7,000 gender stuff. You know what I mean? That's not what liberal meant in the 1700s. Very different than today. Born in Scotland in 1734, he was less than a decade older than Jefferson. Small was, in addition to professor of mathematics at the college, the interim professor of moral philosophy. Yeah, a little philosophy described by a contemporary as a polite, well-bred man. <laughs> well-bred. It's livestock. Small lived in two rooms in the college. The accommodations, it was said, were by no means elegant, but Small and his college were very well satisfied with the homeliness of their appearance, though at first sight they were rather disgusting. <laughs> That's funny. A bit more care seems to have been taken with clothing than with interior decoration. Faculty were expected to have a suit of handsome full dress silk clothes to wear on the king's birthday at the governor's. You would wear special clothes just for the king's birthday? No way. You know, I'm happy I never have to meet a king or a queen because I would hate to have to put on some fancy clothes just to meet them. I'd be like, uh, you poop and pee just like me. Your family's probably more inbred. You exist off the work of others. The only reason why I'm afraid of you is because you can order one of your guards to chop my head off. Other than that, you're just a regular person and no one really special with any special ideas and you've been sheltered and privileged and isolated from the real raw world. And if you didn't have your stupid crown and you had to walk in the slums, your ass would get beat. So I'm sorry if I'm not impressed. Side rant. <laughs> Maybe that's part of my colonial American mind thought. Down with the British. Down with the king. You know? No red coats. Ironic, because I'm in a red sweater. <laughs> I would have definitely been on the revolutionary side during this. <laughs> to wear special clothes for the king's birthday. Where it was expected that all English gentlemen attend and pay their respects. Well, thank God for freedom. <laughs> like, imagine if we had to wear nice clothes today for all our, our president's birthday. Small taught ethics, rhetoric, and bell letters, as well as natural philosophy. What we think of as the sciences and mathematics, lecturing in the mornings and holding seminar-like sessions in the afternoons, in which the professor and his students discuss the material, conversant with the thought of Bacon, Locke, Newton, Adam Smith, and the philosophers of the Scottish Enlightenment. Exactly. We've been reading Adam Smith, His Wealth of Nations. John Locke, Francis Bacon... Newton, I oh, should read some Locke later. I've only read a little bit of him. His political science-y stuff, but not his other philosophy, his enlightenment stuff. Small introduced Jefferson to the key insight of the new intellectual age, that reason, not revelation or unquestioned tradition or superstition, deserved pride of place in human affairs. Yeah, the Scottish Enlightenment was a very interesting time. It truly, truly was. Under Small's influence, Jefferson came to share Immanuel Kant's 1784 definition of the spirit of the era. Enlightenment is man's emergence from his self-imposed immaturity, Kant wrote. Immaturity is the inability to use one's understanding without guidance from another. This immaturity is self-imposed when it causes lies not in lack of understanding, 
but in lack of resolve and courage to use it without the guidance from another. Courage to use it without the guidance from another. It does take courage to, you know, have a resolve. Hmm. Interesting. This was Small's message to his charge at William and Mary. Jefferson was entranced, later giving Small the noblest of accolades when he recalled that Small was to me a father. Yeah. That's kind of like how Jefferson felt with, for Small, it's like how I feel with Mufti Mac, right? You have like a father figure, an intellectual father figure, right? Who is somebody who can guide you in addition. Because remember, Jefferson's dad is dead, right? So you're going to latch on to a professor, an intellectual, an elder, a sage, a philosopher, you know, you name it. Somebody who is trying to improve their consciousness and doing it in dynamic ways without being detached from reality, yet can also escape reality via the mental faculties, right? It's fascinating. Uh, there's a lot we all can relate to with college life and with enlightenment in general. What do you think, fam?